And you know, we meet on the third Monday of, the, of every month, either Zoom or, or in person one of these days. David's talked to you about that. Here's um, the 2021 programs, and they'll eventually all be on our, uh, the homepage of our website. And I think I actually do have them under the section called the 40th anniversary, just to, with a little bit more detail. But one of the reasons why um, we wanted to do tonight is just to kind of give you an overview of, of all of Highlands Ranch. And then in the months to come, we're going to be zooming in even, even more closely. So like in February, we're doing just the 20 years or so from, from Mission Viejo. March, we've got um, Centennial Water, which is a, we've never done anything on Centennial Water, looking forward to that, and et cetera, et cetera. So by the time we've done the entire year, um, you should have a good picture of what historical aspects of Highlands Ranch are and um, current modern day aspects. I, I think it's gonna be fascinating. Let's, how do you like that big uh, arrow? Is that good or what? Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Right. Let's go again. So just, uh, I think everybody knows, uh, or pretty much everybody on this uh, Zoom knows the uh, what Highlands Ranch looks like. Up in the far northwestern um, and, and kind of northeastern, the far northern boundary of, of uh, Douglas County. Um, basically from Quebec on the east all the way over to Santa Fe or Chatfield on the west and then county line on the north and then going down into the back country in the south. So uh, and most of the things that we're going to be talking about tonight are actually going to be all over the place. So some of our settlers, we've, we had settlers uh, who settled all over the area, but the ones we'll be talking about are are basically spread out all over. We'll be getting a good picture of Highlands Ranch. And let's start back 68 million years ago. As you, as most of you know, um, dinosaurs were discovered on the Windcrest property in um, 2019. It was a pretty exciting time. All of the uh, Windcrest residents uh, had a bird's eye view if they wanted one, uh, kind of an overview of the area. That's when they were excavating for a new building there and they found some bones. The Denver Museum of Nature and Science came in and gathered the bones that were there. And so they're all at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science now. And it's uh, so interesting. It was a triceratops. And then as we learned uh, a little bit ago when we did the, uh, the video on that, when uh, Jamie Leary with Channel 4 News did, she said that in addition to the Triceratops, they had discovered um, two Triteris, Triteris, whatever, those horned dinosaurs, there were two of them, a small one and then the large one, um, as well as a smaller duckbill dino. I don't know what the name of the duckbill dino was. So here's just some pictures from the dig site. Natalie Toth was uh, one of them from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, the chief fossil preparator. There's Jamie Leary. She did do a video on that and that is on our website. So if you want more info, you can watch the uh, half hour program on that. And they've uh, finished digging at the site now and um, uh, because they're going to continue building, but pretty exciting. So we, uh, it's kind of fun to know that we have a, a dinosaur or we had some. Let's zoom forward a few million years and now let's go over to Chatfield. And if you can recall from that screen or that shot of the map, Chatfield is just on the other side of uh, Santa Fe. So I think it's pretty uh, sure that the mammoths and the animals that they found there probably wandered across Santa Fe and, and made their way into Highlands Ranch. If you have not done that tour, um, I'd certainly recommend it and we might try to do a separate one or, or work with them this coming um, summer and, and fall and see if we can get one scheduled. But it's fascinating. They did find some mammoths. They found um, a whole bunch of different animals here where it says life at the spring. So um, pronghorn antelopes, bison, camels. We had camels here, horse, wolf, the Colombian mammoths, which were about the size of an African elephant and then some slots. And the picture that you see with the mountains in the background, that's the little uh, hut where they have the, on the previous screen here, the actual tusk. It's a, it's a replica, but they have that in there, uh, just kind of uh, 
lounging around. And this is the spring. This depression in the earth is the spring where they were found. In addition to the mammoths then, um, a few thousand years later, apparently the um, uh, Cody complex Indians also had a bison kill. So they were in the area and they used the spring. I guess they um, uh, captured some bison as they were going down to get a drink. So kind of, kind of a lot of activity in that general area. And that bison kill was about 8,800 years ago. So again, probably all of these animals and or natives were in our areas as well. There were other Native Americans in the general area, um, the Utes, the Comanches, uh, Cheyenne and Arapaho, uh, even though I don't know that anyone has found any actual um, settlements in the Highlands Ranch area, but we know that they were in the, in the entire general area. Then um, moving on a few thousand years, let's go to the uh, 16th century picture there of the United States. And if you look in the middle, you see the Louisiana Purchase, and that's where our area of Colorado would be. So during that time, in the 15th and 16th centuries, 16th and all, um, it was the land was kind of going back and forth between Spain and France and uh, with the European influence. And then finally in 1803, Napoleon, uh, I think he was worried that they were going to war with Great Brit Britain and maybe Great Britain would have won. But in any event, he sold the uh, Louisiana Purchase, which was quite a big area. Thomas Jefferson was the president at that time, and they paid $15 million. So that was, uh, th uh, at that point then, our area here, the, this area of Colorado would have become part of the United States. And so with that happening in 1803, that really then started opening up a lot, of, a lot more exploration and activity in this general area. And that's when we had the uh, explorers and mountain men and uh, homesteaders, uh, people coming here for gold. So a lot of activity started happening then in the 1800s. Um, and Douglas County was um, fortunate to have several, of course it wasn't Douglas County then, but uh, there was a lot of uh, trade routes and all in the area, Santa Fe and the uh, Smoky Hill and various others. So. Platte River, the South Platte River was bringing people up. So there was a lot of activities coming up into that area. Also then, uh, during that time, we had the gold rush in 1858, 1859, you know, Pikes Peak or bust. And uh, so with gold being discovered all around, um, either in Colorado Springs or in the Cherry Creek area up in uh, Idaho Springs, it was bringing a lot of people out here to this general area. Then just a couple of years later, we had uh, this area became uh, Colorado Territory became official and Douglas County was one of the original 17 counties then. And huge boundaries all the way from the South Platte in the West all the way to the Kansas border. Uh, interestingly though, we only had a population of about a thousand people. Uh, most of the people that were coming out then during that time were um, settlers involved in agriculture and farms or cattle, and a lot of sawmills, a lot of lumbering was going on. Uh, life apparently here was very difficult. There were grasshopper invasions and uh, hailstorms, and, and of course we know not, lack of water, their lack of experience. So all of that led to a very difficult time. And as we start looking at a lot of the people who filed for homesteads and all who came out here, they just couldn't make it. It was a, it was a tough, Tough land at that time. So that brings us to the homestead, homesteaders and settlers. And in 1850, 1862, the Homestead Act was passed. And for a few years after that, they kept modifying it or, and or adding to it. Um, and the purpose of the Homestead Act was to secure homesteads um, to actual settlers on the public domain. And I just took that directly off of uh, one of the, their, their documents. And President um, Lincoln also was uh, the one involved with that. And that, of course, then accelerated settlement out here in our area. And with that, uh, settlers uh, could get title to free government land if they met some criteria. They had to be a citizen or an immigrant who was uh, going to become a citizen, either 21 years of age or, and or head of household 
for that, they could get 160 acres up to, some of them only uh, might've only had 40, 80, whatever. But there were some other requirements like to build a house. They had to live on it for five years. They had to make improvements. And there was just a very small registration fee. Of course, I guess that's small for us now, but that might've been, might been a little bit of money back then in 1862 and on. And uh, there also, they also had a way that if they wanted to not have to wait the five years, they had, there was an accelerated plan. So they didn't have to do as many improvements had to be there for six months, but the cost was $1.25 uh, an acre. And then at the end of the five-year plan, the settler had to prove up. In other words, they had to provide proof that they actually had done the things like building the, the house and living on it and making improvements. And it's um, interesting when, um, when you go back and you look at some of the the maps of the, you know, uh, the early, the early home uh, landowners. Um, you can see it's kind of checkerboarded. They had them in grids, of course, and um, you could get a, a quarter section or a section, and you know, various combinations. The railroads had a lot of land out here as well. So when you're looking at this grid on uh, here, where you see the, kind of the blank squares, those were all railroads, and the railroads, of course, could also sell their land. Um, so there was a lot of activity. Uh, one researcher had estimated that there were at least 189 people that had applied for homesteads in our uh, Highlands Ranch area. Most of them didn't stay, uh, again, because it was difficult to actually do the work. So most of them ended up selling um, or just not even finishing their, their homestead, but, uh, but at least they started out. And then here, I know these are not easy to read. I can't hardly read them either. But when you look back at some of the old newspapers, um, they, the settlers, when they were ready to prove that they had actually you know, done what they were supposed to do, uh, worked the land and had a house and all that, they put it as a notice for publication and then they had to show up at the, uh, the court to provide that actual proof. So the one on the la left here where it's uh, dated September 2nd, 1890, it says, notice is hereby given that the following name settler has filed notice of his intention to make final proof in support of his claim. And that said proof will be made before the judge of the County Court of, County Court of Douglas um, at the Castle Rock on October 16, 1890. And this settler was Lewis Bowman and it was a homestead application. Then it lists the location, the range and the township. And, and then it says, he names the following witnesses to prove his continuous residence upon and cultivation of said land. And his witnesses, one of them is Lafayette Griggs, who we'll be talking about. And then he names a few others. On the other one over there, notice for publication on May 2nd, same thing. And this settler was John Schweiger, uh, Schweiger from the Schweiger Ranch over on I-25 in Lone Tree. And his uh, witnesses to, to uh, prove his continuous uh, residence was Henry Say, um, Placido Gasner, William Ban Bran, and John Welty. So I think it's just interesting. It shows that obviously, um, even though they had fairly good sized plots of land, the, everybody was neighbors. Everyone knew one another, or at least their immediate neighbors, and, and they went um, you know, to court and or uh, you know, to help prove and to help to, to work with one another. So this Lewis Bowman on the left, uh, he, he actually, I don't think he, he was very prominent at the time. Um, he's not around now because one of the newspaper clippings said, uh, unfortunately, someone found him in his property. He was burned to a crisp. So unfortunately, he didn't make it. But his uh, neighbor, Lafayette Griggs, we'll talk about. And then on the other side there with Schweiger, we know the Schweiger Ranch in Lone Tree, and Henry Say, um, is his property was right on the boundary of Monarch at Monarch and um, MacArthur Ranch, and then his neighbors were the Gasners and the and John Welty of the uh, Cheese Ranch. Um, so it's just kind of fun making the connections and and also then the work that they had to go through to prove that they were settlers and, and living there. In addition to the Homestead Act, we also had the Timber Culture Act, and that was uh, from 1873, 
And the purpose of that was to encourage the growth of uh, growth and cultivation of timber on the Western prairies. And so with that Timber Culture Act, they, uh, the settlers could get an additional 160 acres of land as long as they planted 40 acres of trees. And I thought this was interesting. One of the other people we'll be talking about here very shortly is um, uh, S. Allen Long, Sam Allen Long, who was the, the person who started the, the stone farmhouse that's now the mansion. And he had a homestead and he also had a timber culture uh, property. And this is what he said. Um, uh, I would advise the planting of black locust and black walnut trees in all localities deficient in water. I regard black locust trees as the tree of most certain growth. The black walnut, soft maple, and elm follow in order named. And then he also wrote, um, S. Allen Long writes that the trees grown without irrigation on his farm in the north part of the county are some of them 16 feet high as the result of five years growth, and there are thousands of them. So um, Samuel Allen Long obviously got into it. In fact, he was known for his uh, dry land farming techniques. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, and Susie, I, I saw you on, the, on our list of people here, but I, I believe that uh, stand of trees just south of the mansion there along the walking trail is black locust trees or locust trees. So might they have been planted by good old Mr. Long? Kind of, kind of interesting, I, I sure hope so. So lots of things bringing settlers here. Uh, so here's some of them that we're gonna be talking about tonight. Um, just real briefly uh, about all of them again, um, but uh, we'll talk about Dad Clark, uh, the Pine Tree Ranch, which was the uh, Lafayette Griggs Underwood Ranch, the Big Dry Creek Cheese Ranch with Johan Welty and Placido Gasner, uh, Failing Douglas Investment Company, Matthew Plew's house, which uh, became the Flying Bee, and then of course, mansion owners. So there's good old Rufus Clark or Dad Clark. Um, we don't really have any buildings left from him, but we do have a street named after Dad Clark. And he's really interesting. He'd be fun to do a whole program on one of these nights. Um, he was known as the Potato King. He bought property somewhere on the west side of Highlands Ranch. He, he actually had property everywhere. He was known for the Clark Colony, which is just right up Holly and uh, Orchard. And he also owned the land that is now um, the University of Denver. Um, and his, apparently his homestead was up there where, um, what is it, the Overland Golf Course now off of Santa Fe. So he just had property everywhere. He made a fortune selling potatoes. And as it says here, he was a Denver University um, benefactor. He donated a land and $500 to get the, uh, to get the university uh, up and running. We also have the Pine Tree Ranch, which we know as the Griggs uh, area or Griggs Road. So even though we don't really see a house there, but we do have a road uh, named in his honor. And that was started around 1871. And then it actually went for quite a few years into the twenties. It started out as the Underwood Griggs Ranch because the wife, Lorinda, was at first married to William Underwood. She divorced him and then married Lafayette Griggs, his parents had one of the homesteads in the back country. So they knew one another. And actually, I think it was pretty close to the um, to Lewis Bowman. So then they married and they stayed there for many years. It's interesting, this picture that we see here, it says the Underwood Griggs Homestead House as it appeared in the summer of 18, or 1979. Um, and it was at that time that the grandson came back to visit the house this of course was right when Mission Viejo took over. And so the house was still standing and they just walked right in, he said. And the house looked like it was in pretty nice condition, but they wanted to come back and, and see the house and he brought his wife and they kind of looked all over the land. Um, this is what it looks like today. Um, I find that kind of hard to believe, but um, I know that's what it looks like today because I've been, back there and it's just, it's, you know, in pretty, pretty rough shape, but it is still there. It is not accessible to just to anybody. It is all uh, fenced off um, to try to preserve it as best we can. And that is in the area called the back country and um, HRCA does do periodic um, trips into the back country on all kinds of, you know, reasons. I know we've, they've done some historic trips back to um, the 
Griggs Ranch and also to the Douglas Failing, which we'll be talking about in a minute. Uh, this picture in the, uh, with the woman in the blue outfit, that is Norma Griggs. Norma is the wife of the grandson, uh, William. And when we met her, she uh, definitely wanted to come back and see the property because she was with Bill on that uh, trip out in 79. And she mentioned, she says, I want to see the silo. So it sounds like they must have had, the, the grandkids must have had parties or whatever in the silo. But unfortunately, that's what the silo looks like today. Um, I can only surmise that probably it was all torn down with as part of uh, Mission Viejo for, for whatever. And they, uh, at, what you're gonna find with all of these settlers that at least we have some record of is it wasn't just, they didn't just get one um, small homestead or you know the homestead of 160 acres, but they filed for one, then they might get a timber culture, then they might buy with cash from some of the other people that didn't make it. And many of them also had a lot of family members in the area. So as we saw, it's, it was difficult to farm this land. So having more land, which they needed, and also then having the help of their family members and all made a really big difference. So in this case, we had the Griggs homestead, uh, their relatives, uh, Lorinda was a Palmer, so some of her Palmer relatives were there. Um, uh, and, and we just find that in, in many different areas here. And so you all know where Griggs Road is uh, heading towards the back country and heading up towards Daniels Park. And most of these settlers also um, ended up staying here in the general area. And so Lafayette Griggs is buried in Littleton Cemetery. Lorinda, his wife, is buried there as well, but she's buried with her parents. Um, so she's not buried with, not buried with Lafayette, but, uh, but, but they're all there. And, and that road there, Griggs Road, is also known as, or was known as the Territorial Road. And it also went past the, um, the Cheese Ranch. So it was a, a, an important trade route between Denver and, and um, Castle Rock and Colorado Springs. So there would have been people uh, going backwards and forwards on there. Just a little farther up, a little farther south of the Griggs Ranch is um, the Daniels Park and the Sanctuary Golf Course. And right out in front of the Sanctuary Golf Course, you'll find this marker. It's really hard to read and you gotta, gotta kinda look for it. It's not gonna just jump out at you. But it says this was where Kit Carson made his last campfire in 1868. He was traveling with his friend DC Oaks. And this was supposedly the site of his last campfire. They went on down to, I believe it was New Mexico and, and he died not, not too long after that. So a lot of history there along the territorial road in addition to the fact that we've got Daniels Park and, and um, Cherokee Castle and all those kind of things. Then on the other end of the territorial road was the Big Dry Creek Cheese Ranch. Uh, and that's right up at the border of County Line. And so the border between Arapaho and Douglas. And this was settled by Austrian immigrants, um, Welty and Gasner, and they were actually related. Their wives were sisters. So Welty's uh, wife, Theresia, was a sister of Gasner's wife, Mary. So again, we have the example of the families kind of sticking together. And they did a very similar thing to what we just saw back there with the Griggs family, they not only bought, uh, bought one property, but they bought another property and another property and another property in various family members' names. And so then collectively, they ended up with a very large successful ranch. And their ranch then was a dairy farm. They had uh, obviously cows, they made cheese, they made beer. You see good old uh, uh, John there with a beer in his hand and everything in between. They had a lot of different um, things that they grew, food for the animals, food for them. And they were also known for dry land farming, which was very popular back then, necessary because of the drought. This is after all the high prairie, uh, the high desert. And he was actually written up in a scientific farmer magazine. And they were so impressed with the farm and uh, some of their innovative techniques that they did a two, uh, two episode spread on them, just going into how neat and clean everything was. There was not a weed to be found. Um, uh, they had a lot of different buildings. They had the cheese factory right next to the house. They had 
um, mechanical rooms, bunk houses, privies, uh, everything. So it was a very successful farm for a, a long time, from 1879 to 1943. It's also interesting, the Big Dry Creek Cheese Ranch, they were um, more on the northern side, so they focused most of their uh, dealings into the Littleton area. And in fact, if you go to the Littleton Museum, they have uh, two or three displays there from the Big Dry Creek Cheese Ranch. So they focused their business into Littleton, uh, whereas on the Lafayette Griggs and probably the Failings, they focused their business into Sedalia. Uh, so they went the opposite direction on the territorial road. Here's just some pictures of what it looked like. This was the house. It was uh, very nice. I've seen pictures on the inside of it. Don't uh, have them on here, but um, very fancy for the time that the smaller one story thing there is the cheese factory attached to the house. They actually even had underground plumbing um, heat that went between the house and the cheese factory and, and other places and apparently was heated with cow chips, um, but they were pretty, pretty far advanced for their time. This was the, this is a view looking to the back of the house. And then the lower picture is the view obviously looking at the cows and the huge barn and take a good pick, uh, good look at that barn because we're gonna see it here in just a minute. And uh, you'll, you'll be able to compare the difference. Here's just a picture of the family. Um, they made brick cheese and Limburger and the processes for both, uh, uh, they were kind of, uh, they helped one another. They could use the brick cheese and then they used some of the, I guess the whey or whatever and they made the Limburger cheese. And in any event, it sounds delicious. Uh, one of the wealthy daughters married Philip Renner, and Renner then um, kind of took over the business as John um, aged. Gasner unfortunately died pretty early in this process, but his wife Mary stayed on. So here in the picture, oh, I've got my thing here, let's see. So this is um, Theresia Welty, the, the one sister and the wife of John. And then this is John Welty, and this is her sister. Mary Gasner, there, here's their kids, and here's their kids. I don't know if you can see it, but here's a man standing in the back, he's holding a dog. What's in his hand? Beer, a stein of beer. So I think they, <laughs> I think they had a lot of beer in that, uh, in that family. And this unfortunately is what uh, the property looked like when Mission Viejo came. Uh, they took quite a few pictures of it. This is that same barn that we saw just a few minutes ago. You can see the the, the top part of the barn and all, and you can see what terrible condition it's in. So um, apparently that the property at that time was being vandalized quite a bit. And so Mission Viejo then just basically raised everything, got rid of all of the property and all of the buildings. Uh, they're all gone, even though apparently that house was still in nice condition. Um, it's all gone now. And really the only thing that's left, it is a, it is a farm, a, a park farm. And uh, there's a replica windmill there, and there is a nice community garden. There's some nice paths to walk. There's also the big dry creek, so it's interesting to go and look at the water. But no buildings, uh, nothing uh, tangible of the uh, of the buildings that that were there. Then let's go back to the back country, and here's the failing homestead. And, um, and then later on, it became the Douglas Investment Company. And this is in the back country. And these two pictures here are what it does look like now. We don't have any historical pictures, at least none that I've seen or, or, or have been able to find. Um, but there's still quite a few buildings that are back there. They're off limits. We don't get to go back there, except with HRCA. And HRCA does, again, have have uh, hay rides back there and or various kind of activities. So if you haven't, certainly recommend that you take one of their um, expeditions to the back country. It's fascinating. Uh, here's a large farmhouse that was built, very simple, very simple in design, but adequate. The failings uh, were quite a large family. And then this silo is uh, very interesting. There are only two of them in the entire uh, Douglas County, and it is called Tongue Lock. It's wooden, and it's an octagon. So they're like interlocking, um, kind of like Django, I guess, the, the game Django, where they're, they're interlocking um, pieces of wood, and it is still in very good condition. It was uh, very, very well made. Here's a, a 
plat here of some of the property and the failings did the same thing that the Griggs and the um, Welty families did. And that is that they bought many different uh, pieces of, of land, either homesteading or timber culturing or, or just outright buying them and under different people's names. Like if sometimes the, the husband would homestead and then the wife or the grown son might uh, file for a homestead. So altogether they had, uh, I believe it was about 2000 acres or so. And this is in the back country. You can see here, this is uh, the railroad and Santa Fe. So they're very close to the Santa Fe. And up here is Griggs. That was uh, Lafayette Griggs's father. So this is probably where Lafayette as a kid spent time. And then of course went over just just a little bit to meet his wife, Lorinda. So the Failings had the property until uh, 1913. Again, they were a large family, uh, but then the Failings started failing in health. Um, uh, one or both of them had a stroke and they ended up selling to the Douglas Investment Company who kept it for quite a while as uh, probably as, as ranching. Um, so they were very busy. They had a lot of a lot of kids. They were ranchers, farmers. They had an orchard, aviary, cattle. Their brand was the Circle F brand, and they also had stud horses that apparently were very well known in Douglas County: Spanish Jack and Pacing Stallion. Um, they were socially active and uh, a good part of the of the community. And they're buried in Fairmont uh, Cemetery. Now let's go to the extreme northwest part of the uh, Highlands Ranch area, Douglas County. And you can see up there we have the, uh, this is kind of where uh, C-470 meets Santa Fe. Right over here is the Chatfield area. So this area in here then was the Plews um, and which eventually became the Flying Bee Ranch. And also over here on this side of Santa Fe was the area called Lakeland, and um, we'll talk about that in just a minute. So Matthew Plew's family, they bought it in uh, 1906, and Matthew was a landscaper, a master gardener. He worked at Woolhurst Estate, which, whoops, let's go back to the picture. Woolhurst was just right over here. Ah, where is my, where'd my thing go? Okay. So slow, Nancy. So Walhurst was just right over here. So he worked here and then he bought here. And uh, a lot, again, a lot happened in that general area of Walhurst and Blakeland and one of our other characters, good old smiling Charlie, we'll talk about him. So Matthew Plews then, um, he was, he, had, he built the house. He had a large family. He had a, a started uh, the landscaping business. He also was very involved in Littleton and Douglas County. Probably most of his activities were centered around Littleton, but there's uh, newspaper clippings and all where he was uh, involved with Douglas County uh, Fair and, uh, and the school that was there in um, right on the other side of, of uh, Santa Fe. He also was hired to plant trees for Littleton Cemetery. So, uh, and that's when Littleton Cemetery was just brand new. So it's kind of fun when you go today and you see all those great big beautiful trees you can think back uh, and thank back to Matthew Clues. In fact, he was known as the Johnny Appleseed of the area. And Matthew and his family are um, actually buried in Littleton Cemetery. And here's a picture of good old Matthew when he was probably 18 to 20 or so. Here's a, a picture of his um, business card, the Clues Greenhouses, uh, his phone. It says phone Littleton 1834, and he was on what is that, rural route number one, box 20. Um, and there's a lot of, uh, in the newspapers, he, he did a lot of advertising for his services and his greenhouse and his landscaping services. And here's a picture of the house that Plews built. And it actually looks kind of similar to the one that's there today. Only you see the big field there of the uh, field with plantings and also the large greenhouses because he again was a landscaper and. His whole focus was not just on animals, but it was on, um, on the plantings. And this is right along the Highline Canal as well. So then Matthew and family, uh, they lived there for quite a few years and in 37 then they sold. And when they sold, they sold to the family, uh, the mother-in-law of Smiling Charlie. And they held that from 19, 
1937 uh, until 1944. And the Plus, a lot of these uh, uh, properties were sold during the depression. In fact, the Griggs family, when they sold their house, that was also, uh, I think it was in 44, but they actually had stopped production of the cheese factory in like 38. So depression certainly had a big, big effect in the area. Um, so when that was sold, they sold it to Elizabeth Hamlin, who was the mother-in-law of Smiling Charlie. And at that point, Char uh, Smiling Charlie uh, was pre I, apparently pretty well known in the area, not for good things, but more for being on the wrong side of the law. So it sounded like crime abounded in that general area of uh, where Blakeland and along Santa Fe. I'm gonna read to you what it says under Smiling Charlie's picture, because I think it's so cute. It says O.E., that was his name, Ova Edward, Edwards, I think, um, O.E. or Smiling Charlie Stevens, who usually doesn't smile, smiled yesterday when he really didn't have anything to smile about. Stevens was all set to be freed on a $50,000 bond, but one of his friends decided not to post the necessary property, so Charlie went back to jail. He will try again today. Sounds like Charlie was in and out of prison, not only jail, but prison. He was tried on tax evasion. He was also tried for bombing um, uh, one of his business associates. And he went to prison down in Canyon City uh, for that, along with the, the Smaldone brothers. Um, so he was, he was very busy in the area, not farming, but doing all these other nefarious things. At one point when he came out then, in 44 then, they sold the... Uh, their property here and they bought Woolhurst and then they turned Woolhurst into a big nightclub but that's for another another day. When they sold they sold to the Eberhard family and um, Eberhard Fre Fred and Marguerite. Um, Fred was a mechanical engineer he was very well known in the field he had multiple awards he had multiple uh, you know business plants to make the make the uh, things and his business um, motto was more horsepower for the dollar. And that was Eberhardt Denver. And then they sold that uh, to Borg Warner, which is a name that we certainly know. Uh, when they owned it, it was basically, my understanding was it was basically used as a summer house because they also had a house then in Denver, but this was their summer getaway. And they owned it for almost 20 years. So the next owner, was the Bowen family. Uh, and actually the, the property was just briefly owned by the Gates Rubber Company. Gates bought it specifically because they wanted to trade land that Johnny Bowen, the juniors and seniors had um, nearby. The Gates Rubber Company wanted their land, which was basically at uh, Broadway and County Line, you know, kind of where there's a, a dollar store there now. And a, um, what is it? A Goodwill, I think it is. I think that was the area that they had and the Gates Rubber Company wanted that. So they traded the Flying Bee for that. And uh, Johnny, Bowen call, uh, Johnny Bowen was um, a pilot and he was a cattle rancher. So he had cattle ranch in Strasburg and he used his plane to fly to his ranch. And so hence the name, the Flying Bee Ranch. So flying for B for Bowen not necessarily be for bees that they kept there, but for Bowen, because he was a bee and he flew. Makes sense. Here's a picture and it says, uh, his words were the best little cattle ranch in Colorado. And look at that wonderful view, wide open looking towards the west. And uh, must've been pretty, pretty spectacular. It was a nice size uh, piece of land there along the Highline Canal. There were some natural springs. Uh, several ponds. So he had plenty of water and a beautiful area. And then what happens? Inter or C-470 comes along. So they lived there for quite a long time. And eventually they just decided it was time to sell. It wasn't quite the same. And, and next time you drive on C-470, right there by uh, what's Windcrest now, look over and you'll see the house. and um, and you can just imagine how it must have been when only about a block or two away, all of a sudden you have a freeway in your, in your backyard. So this is what the house looks like today. When we open it up for questions, I know there's a lot of you on, on our Zoom tonight who have a lot of information about all of this. Um, thank you, Susie and Susie, for the material on, on the Flying Bee here and 
Uh, if anybody is from Metro is here and you have any kind of an update on perhaps what you're doing with or what's going to be happening with the house, um, it would be interesting to hear. But the Bowens then kept the house uh, until two, uh, kept the property until 2004, and they sold it then to um, to Ericsson, which is the uh, company that owns Windcrest. And so when you drive down that area again, take a look at Windcrest and it's just expanding exponentially. It's a very big development and it was very good of Windcrest. They deeded um, five acre parcel to, oops, I don't have it on there, but they deeded the five acre parcel to um, Highlands Ranch Metro District. And I think that was in, oh, there it is, in 2006. And, uh, and so then they, um, it's, it's now a park. There's a nice picnic pavilion. There's still the pond. And um, the last that I had heard, and again, anybody who knows more, please correct me, but that it possibly might become maybe a, um, a senior center until the real one is built. Don't know, but lots going on or possibly can be going on in that area. So let's, oh, uh, let, just before we leave them, uh, then if you notice, we had those three, um, homesteads or, or, or settlers that were stayed there for a long time were basically single owners and or their families and were there for many, many years and prospered. The flying bee is different in that regard too, because as you see, there were many owners and, um, and then eventually it has, uh, you know, sold from, sold from owner to owner to owner, it just didn't stay in the family. And this is also a park then. Okay. Uh, zipping right along. Let's go to the mansion because those were also some early settlers there. And here we have, uh, it started out as a farmhouse. This is Samuel Allen Long. We already saw where he uh, talked a little bit uh, back to us about his uh, timber um, culture act. He uh, built this home and it was just a small basic um, uh, farmhouse made out of field stone. And he called it Rotherwood. And he started expanding as well. He started buying more and more and more land, uh, both either buying them with cash or homesteading, or he did have a timber culture patent. And unfortunately, oh, well, here's dry land farming. And good old uh, Mr. Long was very well known, it sounds like, in the neighborhood for his dry land farming. He was being written up in the papers all the time. So I'm just going to read this real quickly here. It says, um, Mr. Uh, S. Allen Long on his mammoth farm a few miles from Littleton and above, and above irrigation has succeeded in raising 40 and even 50 bushels of corn to the acre without ditch water. He, his method is to plow 14 inches deep, put the land in the best of tilth, and when the young plant is up, put on the roller and roll it down. Sounds like that hurt. Then through the summer, keep in cultivator keep the cultivator going often. He is confident of 60 bushels in the present season. That's pretty good. I looked it up and it sounds like back then, if you, if you had 11 bushels of corn, you were doing well. So if he was getting 40 and 50, he was doing well. Another one of his uh, 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 posts in the paper says that uh, he has had no water except what it got from the clouds. He credits much of his success to deep plowing. So the dry land farm is, farming is kind of a, a theme of a lot of these farmers from wealthy to, to uh, long and also in a little bit as we'll see to the um, centennial, the movie centennial. We're not gonna read that. Oh, he did talk about his timber culture trees wintered well and are now healthy. So it's just nice uh, trying to tie things together. So poor Mr. Uh, long had an accident with a cable car and his buggy and he ended up selling the next owner of that uh, property was John Springer, an attorney and a politician. He named the property the Springer Cross Country Horse and Cattle Ranch. And then later he renamed it Castle Isabel. And he also then kept buying property and it said that he was actively looking uh, for uh, people who wanted to, to buy, to sell. Um, and so the property kept getting bigger and bigger. So now we went from that small little farmhouse, which is that Long had, which would be here, to now to the, uh, he's added quite a bit of property or building to the house. His uh, uh, undoing was his second wife, Isabel, who decided to lead some excitement and she ended up getting involved with some men who, who killed, uh, had a murder at the Brown Palace. There's a book that you can read all about it, good old Dick Crack. We've done programs on that. It's fascinating. Um, so I highly recommend it if you haven't read that book. 
So when John found out about his second wife, Isabel, having suitors and uh, getting involved in all of that, as soon as the murder trial was over, John uh, divorced Isabel. It took five days to, to get a divorce. And then he kind of went off into uh, anonymity after that. And his father-in-law was Colonel William Hughes, who bought the house next. And he was very, very wealthy. He uh, turned the ranch uh, into the name of Sunland Ranch. Didn't have it for too long. It went to his granddaughter, Annie Clifton Hughes, who also happened to be the daughter of John Springer. And she just basically owned it, it sounds like, to sell it. And so she found a willing buyer in Waite Phillips, who was a brother of the uh, Phillips family uh, with the Phillips Petroleum. He was also involved in petroleum and oil. And he owned it for six years. And this is when we see the name Phillips Highland Ranch. And you can see here on the uh, entrance uh, marker, it says Phillips Highland. There's no S in it, Phillips Highland Ranch. And he also was into cattle and he sold it in 1926, moved on. He has land in uh, New Mexico and Oklahoma. And it was probably during either his time or um, Colonel Hughes where the uh, property has now expanded. You can see it's quite a bit bigger. We've even got three stories down here. You know this was Phillips because look at on the barns down here, PH. So for Phillips Highland. And it's also interesting if you look back into the background, you see the windmill, which is still here today. The next owner was Frank Kistler. He owned it from 26 to 37. He renamed it the Diamond K Ranch. He was really into cattle and sheep and poultry uh, because right on the other side of uh, Santa Fe uh, at Blakeland was the Blakeland Poultry Farms. And they did a lot of advertising in the newspapers about how wonderful their poultry was. And uh, Kistler at one point even said uh, his ranch was a combination of things, including the Blakeland uh, poultry. So he probably bought a lot of those birds. And Kistler loved to remodel. So he went, he embarked on a major remodel of the interior of the mansion. He's the one who put in this beautiful fireplace. And when you go there, if you haven't been there, you gotta go. Take a look at the fireplace and right in there, you can see um, pictures of the, of the mansion and pictures of uh, an actual like a, um, as if he had a drone, uh, you know, from above looking down on it. And over here, it says 1929 to 1930. So probably during the time when he was doing his remodeling, he also put in that beautiful staircase. Oops, uh, well, I don't have a picture. And also there is that uh, lovely clock that's in the living room. Uh, I think he was attributed to that as well. Unfortunately, um, Mr. Kistler ran into problems during the depression, just like we've heard um, some of the other owners did. And so he sold the property to Lawrence Phipps. He had already known Lawrence Phipps. They apparently were neighbors in Denver. And previous to that, around 1929, he had invited Lawrence to bring the um, Arapaho Hunt Club. And they had already been established on the property. So it was a natural when the property was up for sale, Lawrence bought it. He was the son of Lawrence Phipps Sr., who was a former senator, very uh, involved businessman on the board of directors of Mountain States Telephone Bell and National Western Stock Show. He was in the military during both World War I and World War II. Um, so very well known in town. And he renamed it now Highlands Ranch. So here's that same entrance marker uh, only now, instead of saying Phipps Highland Ranch, it says Highlands Ranch. And this marker was apparently at uh, the entrance to the property was at what would be today Broadway and County Line Road. So by this time, the property is pretty darn big, 22,000 plus acres, a little bit more, a little bit less. They were always buying and selling. The ranch at this point is the home of the Arapaho Hunt Club. And he actually is the one who lived there for 40 years, whereas the other owners were, you know, maybe for 10 years or so, but Phipps um, really made it his home for the 40 years and was very, apparently very happy there, especially with the Hunt Club. He's buried in the Bear Canyon Cemetery and that's on 108. And here's a quick picture of the Arapaho Hunt Club. And, um, Lawrence was very well known. He was honored with the title of Master of the Hunt. They used English, English hounds and they housed the hounds and the horses and their caboose, which was like their social club. 
It's all in what is today the uh, law enforcement training facility, which is off of Santa Fe Drive. So when Phipps died in 76, Marvin Davis, who was big in oil, also in California, was big in movies and uh, things like that. Um, he formed a, a venture group to, uh, to market the property, and they eventually uh, found Mission Viejo, Mission Viejo, who put in an option to purchase the property. This is what it looked like around 1978 when they were up in a, a plane just taking pictures. And you can see, basically, that's the mansion in the middle with, with nothing but the mountains in the background. So just a huge, huge uh, acreage for development. And it was during that time then, in kind of in the transition, possibly, probably, maybe, with uh, Marvin's um, Hollywood connections, but Universitas came to Highlands Ranch and they filmed the miniseries Centennial, a part of it here, not the whole thing, but it brought, uh, they named it uh, Vannaford Ranch and we have a Vannaford Ranch today. There were some stars and, and, and Hollywood people all over the place. We also did a program on that and we do have a, a videotape or a, a, an oral history on that. So uh, when you, if you go to our website, you can uh, uh, click on that and, and hear a lot more about it. They talk about uh, using potato flakes to make it snow and uh, all kinds of things. So for Mission Viejo, um, and next month, David is going to be doing the entire program on Mission Viejo. So we're going to just kind of power through this. But um, Mission Viejo um, was the, the owner then who, who bought from Mar Marvin Davis. They're, they already had a Mission Viejo out here in, uh, in Aurora. So the Aurora manager, Pat Farrell, heard about the big property that was for sale. He alerted. I guess, headquarters in California, and then they came out and eventually uh, purchased the property. They had to get a lot of permissions and everything, and David will talk about that. Jim Teffer was the president of the Colorado Division of Mission Viejo. We call him the father of Highlands Ranch. We hope to have um, Jim a little bit on our program next month, at least, and we'll see, some, see a little bit about him. And he was the guiding force, a lot of talented people that came out from California, as well as people that they hired here in Colorado. But you see that right from the beginning, they had a huge development plan. And when you talk to people who back then, when they say that they saw the big six lane um, Highlands Ranch Parkway, and there was no houses, but there was a big six lanes of, of, uh, of street, they mission planned for that right from the, from the get go, which I think was great. So here it is, uh, Highlands Ranch uh, started or they started selling homes, homes from the 70s, 90s, and low 100s. And that the first home then was actually uh, purchased in, in 1981. So that's how we're getting our the 40 years from starting from that first home purchase, 1981. And this picture down here is, uh, is where the model homes were, which was basically at um, Broadway and uh, Northridge. So here was, this is what, Prairie Ridge, I think? No, Jackrabbit, and this is Prairie Ridge. And then over here would be the rec center. What would be the rec center? This is the first home uh, Phil and Kay Scott. And this is what the house looks like today. Uh, if you notice back then, there was no grass, no trees. And today you can't even see the house because there's so much grass and so much trees. And in uh, a couple of months from now, we hope to talk to Phil and Kay and also um, Gary Danny, who was like the second house. So it should be interesting to hear the, the very first, some of the very first homeowners uh, kind of share their, their thoughts and all on, on Highlands Ranch back then. Then in 1997, Mission Viejo sold to Shea Homes and Shea Homes purchased not only the house, the, their Mission Viejo here in Colorado, but also in uh, California. And Shea was big and uh, they had worked on the Hoover Dam, the Golden Gate Bridge, numerous tunnels around the world. So they already had a very good reputation. Uh, we're into building a lot. So from that time forward, we've had a lot of growth with apartments, the town center, um, backcountry homes, which are Shea's, the, and now the newest, then probably the last is in Central Park. And uh, Backcountry is no longer selling new homes. Um, so I think basically the only new homes uh, pretty much are now gonna be in Central Park. We're almost built out. 
So from that point on then with Mission Viejo, they had to, they not only were building homes, but they had to set up a lot of systems. So uh, what is Highlands Ranch now and how was it set up back then? Uh, again, picture of Highlands Ranch. Uh, we all know population is almost 100,000. It'll be interesting to see what the new census shows. Uh, this came from the um, Metro website, 70 plus miles of trails, 26 parks, lots of open space, lots of homes, still around the same 22,000 acres. The back country is kind of, uh, has additional, um, additional miles of trails and I meant to write it in there and didn't get it in. Um, so back right there from the beginning, they, it was kind of set up with the Metro District, which is Metropolitan District. We're also part of Douglas County. And then the Highlands Ranch Community Association, which is um, kind of a governing body because they control a lot with the architectural control standards and uh, uh, CCNRs. So just real quickly on all of them, we've got Douglas County government and they give us a lot of critical services like the schools, the sheriff, and we do have a sheriff substation, um, the Douglas County Library, and then HRCA, which is the community association. I believe it's still the largest community association in the country, which is kind of amazing. It's a homeowner association with the four rec centers. Um, as we all know, they're pretty spectacular and they're governed by a board of directors. They have delegates, they have a general manager, they have uh, CCNRs, which are the rules and regulations and all that, that as homeowners we're required to follow. They also uh, govern architectural control. So what color can you paint your fence? Things like that. Um, picture of the activity guide and some of the rec centers. And the back country I think is pretty spectacularly different. Most communities don't have uh, 8,000 acres of conservation space. Um, and that was deeded to uh, or conveyed from Shea Homes to HRCA in 2006, 2009. And so they've been developing it ever since, adding trails. And there's a lot of activities in the back country. It's pretty, pretty spectacular. And the HRCA also has a lot of nonprofits, which I don't think many of us were aware of. It's uh, uh, cultural affairs and scholarships and therapeutic recreation and conservation. Then we have the Metropolitan District or Metro, and they are kind of like the, the government as well. They are an actual, uh, we, our taxes go to them, a, a, a portion of our taxes. So that's one of the primary ways where they are funded. And they also then uh, are the, the governing body, I guess, for the Centennial Water. They also have recreation programs. They do parks, trails, open space. They're the ones that are in charge of the infrastructure like roads and traffic signals and storm drainage and stormwater management and the fencing and things like that. They do contract with South Metro for fire and, X and Excel, of course, for street lighting. And they also have a lot of community events and they are in charge of the Highlands Ranch Mansion. Um, and they're also kind of organized uh, similar to Metro or uh, to HRCA. They have a manager, they have a board of directors, and, um, uh, and as I say on here, property taxes are the primary source of revenue. And we should all just be very, very thankful for Metro. Their mill levy is really low, 11.205. That is spectacular. Many of the, uh, doing Metro districts is very popular in the newer communities. Um, I just saw one the other day last week, oh, and their mill levy was 50 and ours is 11. So our taxes are like, what, 5%? It's amazing, lowest of any place around. So thank you to Metro, thank you to all of us. And here's the mansion, here's what the mansion looks like now. And in a, a, about three, four months, we're gonna have an entire program on the mansion, both how it was and also then what, it's, what it is now and what it's going to become. It, we all know it's beautiful and it's been remodeled in 2012. It was uh, remodeled and is now open. The next biggest thing I think will be fun is when the historic park and when the entire thing is opened. Right now, you just have the mansion and the grounds. It's about 50 acres, um, including the Chum Young, the Young Chum Hao House. Uh, but uh, when it's all fully opened, it'll be about 250 acres, and that's going to include the ranch buildings uh, and all that. I'm not quite sure when that is all going to happen. So if anyone from Metro is on this call, if you'd like to chime in, that would be great. And that's it. Um, we're going I think David, can you open this up to uh, so that people can um, talk and um, David, uh, I'm gonna stop sharing. Yeah, um, I just 
I just uh, opened it up. So if people have questions, you can now feel free to unmute yourself and ask your questions. And uh, I not well, I did not see any questions in the chat, just so you know. Yeah, that's what I'm looking. So, David, did you say you did not? There are no questions in there. Just a comment that all, all the dinosaur artifacts are down at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And I don't know what their plan is. I know on the video they had talked about maybe they'll be sharing some of them. But again, if anybody has any update on that, that would be interesting. It's too bad. Um, I don't think we'll be able to get to the site. Uh, the Windcrest, it's, it's on Windcrest property, but uh, they'll be able to. So make a friend with someone who lives there if you oh, want to see the site. Nancy? Storm? Yeah, you might be interested in uh, Windcrest is planning to put a park over the location of the dinosaur farm, and they're going to have a kid's park there, and it's going to have a dinosaur theme when they finish that area. Now, is that only going to be for Windcrest? Well, and their guests. It, and their guests, okay. The, obviously, it won't be open to the public. Right. Well, we're all going to be calling you up, John, or uh, <laughs> Norm. <laughs> I have another Thank question you. while I'm on. Uh, you talk a lot about Asequia, and I have, that's where I had my terrible fall here a couple of years ago, and I've never been able to find much information on it. Do you know of some place where I can find it? You know, um, and if anybody has any of that information, it's it, uh, my understanding is Asequia was there along um, Santa Fe. So you had Blakeland. I think Asequia was uh, considered to be a little bit, a little bit more for uh, southern, but I think it was all kind of in that general area of along twenty uh, I twenty or yeah, well, since Highway eighty five Santa Fe. Yeah, they had a uh, railroad siding, and that just disappeared here just a few years ago. Uh, they tore that all up and it, everything. I've been down there on the site, and there's really nothing left. But there's a lot of history in that town, and I'd sure like to get it. Okay, we'll have to look into that. I think it's interesting, not only Asequia, but Blakeland. And with a lot of our settlers, like if you noticed on um, when John Bowman, the backcountry settler, uh, was doing his, you know, proving that he, 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 uh, fulfilled the, the requirements for the um, whatever it was, the homestead, his, uh, uh, they were called, his people there was called, uh, these people were from Asequia. Uh, usually they talked about being from Sedalia in that area, but that one, it said that they were, they were known as being from Asequia on that one. Right, thank you. John Bowman, and he was right by, he was, he was very close to, um, to Santa Fe. Good, good question. We'll, we'll need to all look into it. Thank you. Anything else? You didn't talk much about Highline Canal, but it played a big part in the west end of Highlands Ranch. You know, Potato King had, uh, he used water off the canal, right where the golf course is now. And uh, I'm sure there were several others that uh, I'm in the process of trying to find out who at which irrigation gates that are still on the canal. Uh, John didn't, or Norman, didn't you say that you've, you've walked the entire 71 miles of the canal? Four times. Four times? Okay. <laughs> and in addition to seeing the, the, the ditch from the bottom of it as well. Yeah, that was an unfortunate view. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and there is, you know, the Highline Canal Conservancy and, and everyone, we, and we can also post a link on that to, uh, on our website because they do a lot, of, uh, a lot of education and they also have a lot of guided hikes and, you know, group hikes and also it is a kind of a fun thing to, to get involved with the Highline Canal. We have something like, what, seven miles of it in, uh, in, in Highlands Ranch, I believe, something like that. Yeah, we go from 12 to, let's see, 18, I believe. Oh, maybe nine. Okay, it's about yeah, six. So it's, yeah, seven miles. Yeah. Okay. Good, good. Anything else? All right, everybody. Thank you so much for attending. Please attend the, you know, log in for all the rest of them. And on many of them, we won't be as stretched for time. Uh, we're going to hope for even more participation because especially as we get into, um, 
the Mission Viejo times and, and all, uh, I think a lot of people were, you know, were still uh, around today that were around then. So it'd be great to have some firsthand um, experiences uh, it, it, that you can share with everybody. It was a great right, thank you. Great Thanks, presentation. Thank you, Nancy. Great job. Yeah, probably yeah. post this by the end of the week. And and also we're going on our website, all of this same information we've got, we're, we'll be opening that up as well. So I'll send out an email to everyone with the recording as well as the link to the website with all this info on it. All right. Thank you, Nancy. Great Thank job. You, Nancy. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Shirley. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Susan and Susie. I see you both.